Please bow your hearts with me. God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, let us draw near now. Amen. Nets. I don't hear the word nets without thinking about the story of Ibis. It's a children's book. Well, it's the true story of an actual humpback whale who was rescued from a fishing net off the coast of Rhode Island. Ibis was caught in a net but escaped only to be seriously injured when part of the net was caught around her mouth and wrapped itself around her tail. She couldn't eat and grew ill, recovering only when a group of rescue workers found and released her from the net, a net initially set as a trap. And as I consider some of the more difficult parts of church history, I can't faithfully preach in this space from this text as an actual net looms large above us without naming how problematic the practice of fishing for people can be, even when our intention is to catch them alive and for life. When Jesus says you will fish for people, these men may have heard it as a way out, an opportunity for freedom from the imperial economy, which controlled all facets of their businesses they might have heard it as a good thing. Me, I'm thinking poor little baby whales and something more akin to deadliest catch. Me, I'm thinking about the damage inflicted on whole peoples and cultures when well-meaning believers did the work of fishing for people. Honestly, I'm still working on reconfiguring my thinking around this, even about the net above us to see it as a protection from the unknown maybe, its cautionary presence as something that could be good for us? Could it be a net of love or safety? Could it be a metaphor for a holding space with room for breathing? Or is it a crutch? I'm just not sure. My modern ears hear net and think trap. I think tricked, I think caught. The term fishing for people awakens every suspicion. It's complicated. So take a deep breath with me. For now, we'll leave fishing as a metaphor for evangelism alone and focus on God's new day. We'll take this opportunity to explore in the short time we have together discernment as we begin thinking about and applying the kind of active faith and spirituality Jesus encourages. So there's a lot to sift through in these 12 verses, but we can tease out three points. Repentance as a response to the light among us. The invitation to follow and the final landing point, the learning to do as Jesus did as we begin to teach, proclaim, and heal. Discernment, hearing and responding, tuning in, aligning ourselves with the movement and activity of the spirit. Well, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew and James son of Zebedee and his brother John might be on to something. We don't know and are not given clues to the internal world of these men but they are working class Jewish men in the ancient world. So it would be foolish to assume that they aren't discerning the times, that they aren't men of the scriptures, learning about and considering prophecy, struggling with the realities of life under Roman rule. What we can glean is Jesus's preference for kinship with them, the ordinary people. The message had already made its way to Jerusalem, and now we find Jesus in a much smaller platform, spreading his message and making real his allegiance and desire to connect with all people everywhere. Because a message was circulating. And it began with repentance, 
Repent, turn around, shift, respond to the presence and power of God in this moment, in the here and now. It's not so much a call to morality. It's not so much a call to be good, although it is about goodness. Repent and get on board with God's new day. Change your thinking. Get on board with the rule and reign of God. Get on board with this new reality. Well, they drop everything. The thing that represented a certain sense of security, they cease their doing and preparing when Jesus says, come follow me. Now, some speak of these first called disciples as the dregs of the draft pick whose presence at the shore that day might have meant they'd essentially be left behind. They'd not been selected to be mentored by a rabbi and had perhaps returned home to live ordinary lives as everyday fishermen, members of the lower social class. But they, these ordinary men recognize and respond to, they listen to and hear above all else, God's voice, God's call, and that is discernment. They come and follow and begin to submit themselves to the teaching. So we're talking about total attachment and absolute submission. This is faith and obedience. This is trust. This is fidelity. And it's also a leap into the unknown. Later in Matthew's gospel, we see a call to greater levels of sacrifice as they grow as members of the mission and mystery of Christ. So beyond the teaching, beyond the proclaiming and healing is suffering. The yeses, the noes, the all of the things we'll have to let go. There's the trial and there's the passion. Take another deep breath. Today, we center our hearts on the hope and challenge of discernment, hearing and responding to the call because this is a text of urgency. It is not a proclamation of a future time in heaven. No, it is an announcement about a pressing and present activity, the new day of God among us. It is very much a contemporary word for contemporary ears. So theirs, like ours, is a world of many voices. To whose do we turn? This is a time for listening. With the rise in income disparity, the continued struggle between minimum and living wage, the diminishment of basic integrity as a necessary requirement for leadership, the continued efforts, subtle or otherwise, to erase African-American history, the stories we discard, the stories we keep, the clear and growing lines that separate us politically, the wars, the fear on all sides, and the way we still each think that Jesus belongs to us, to our group. This, my friends, is a time for listening, for the voice that cries, come, follow, and for our obedience to it. Over the past few months, we've begun what we call family table, an opportunity for group spiritual direction where we hold space for and listen to each other as we each watch for the movement of God in our lives. We listen to the voice of God as God calls to us. And these groups are one way that we respond to the call on our lives by pointing each other back to God. Not giving answers or attempting to solve anything, but by helping each other notice spirit's activity. It is work that goes beyond our individual queries. It is work that holds us accountable to God and each other as we explore together our individual stories and their meaning in a larger context. It is how we will discover and discern the spirit among this community. It is the way that we will push and it will push us to action as we become more of what God wants us to be. 
Through it, we evangelize each other into a deeper sense of joy as we continue to grow in the spiritual maturity, in spiritual discernment. So we don't need nets, we don't need traps. A faithful evangelism, according to Jesus, is holistic and relies more on communication and friendship. He centers relationship and models this when he befriends these sets of brothers, inviting them into a deeper dimension of God's presence among them, showing them the good news as he embodies through teaching, preaching, and healing. This kind of formation doesn't mean we separate ourselves or hide away from the world at large. Quite the opposite, actually. We've got to do the work of bending the ark, resisting the forces that push against God's plan. We, you and I, are called to this new light. We are God's witnesses, and the world needs us. The comprehensive package of teaching, proclaiming, and healing has been left to us. As we do the work of transforming the world, making real God's dream of flourishing and wholeness for everybody. Jesus calls us to obedience and action and provides instruction on how to move forward. Jesus gives us purpose and direction and come and follow is just the beginning. What's next is continued discernment and learning, the how of doing it, the answering of the question, what do you really stand for and what have you done to prove it? Take one more of those deep breaths. The light is shining. Something is growing in our midst. Something is changing and we are called to respond to it. The spirit is moving. So as we each strive to move more fully aligned with God's purpose and plan, maybe, and I include myself among these options, maybe you end or seek counsel about that relationship. The, sp the spirit is moving, so maybe you find a new job. Try a new treatment, call a therapist or spiritual director. Keep breathing. The spirit's moving so you say the thing that needs saying, or as directed, get quiet. Maybe you sign up for the project, make the commitment, buy the ticket, fulfill that promise. The spirit's moving, so maybe you make the call. You accept or offer forgiveness. You begin the process, whatever it may be. The spirit is moving, and this is God's new day. So in the next heartbeat, the next breath, listen, then do what God would have you to do. Come and follow. Amen. We'll spend the last three minutes of our time together just quiet. I really want us to take the moment to really hear, to really listen. And so just three minutes, you may close your eyes, you may sit with your hands over your heart, just get comfortable in your seat and just tune in to the voice of God as God speaks to you. Mm -hmm. 